Welcome everyone to our webinar today. We'll wait as people um, join in. We're so happy to have you all today as we're gonna just um, explore an innovative model for integrative pain management um, at a pediatric safety net hospital. So welcome to everyone who's joining us. Um, quickly as um, folks are coming in, uh, I'll just kind of introduce um, a little bit about the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. We're a global interprofessional integrative health association working to transform healthcare, body, mind, spirit, community, and planet. Um, and there's a little bit of our timeline, which is continuing forward into the future. And we'll share a little bit um, more with you about that. Just a reminder as well, we record all of uh, our webinars and we put them on um, the AIHM Global YouTube channel. So you're welcome to review um, this recording there um, as well. And Beth, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you for this next slide. Great, thank you so much, Jess. We are really excited uh, that this year, the Academic Collaborative for Integrative Health, or the Collaborative, merged with the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. So we will be on that timeline soon. I mean, it has happened. It's really great. Our organization remains intact as a business unit within the Academy. So this is part of, a, we're part of our larger global reach now. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the Academic Collaborative, our core members are national academic organizations as well as individual colleges that are associated with the five licensed integrative health and medicine professions, which I have named on the slide. And our membership also includes organizations that are uh, representing traditional world medicines and emerging professions. And these are professions that are engaged in self-regulation and are working toward future licensure. And with that, I would like the next slide, please, Jess because I wanna introduce our wonderful Integrative Practice Webinars Project. This is an, a long time ongoing project within the collaborative. And you can see that the pictures and the names of those who, who, who have been working so hard to bring to us integrative practice, um, integrative practices to talk about what has worked and what hasn't worked so that we can all learn more and, and move forward. And we're really excited about today's presentation, which is part of this series. And I'm going to turn it over now to Steve Cena to introduce our speakers. I think that's the next slide. Is that, am I, am I right, Jess? Oh, no. I'll, oh, I'll no. quickly so, so plug in with you too. I like oh, to remind yeah. everyone. Sorry, we have Jess. That's fine. We have a fellowship um, program that we are starting. Our next cohort starts this October. So you've got a last minute. If anyone's been on the fence and you're thinking you want to join, you can reach out to us, get on our website, learn a little bit more. We just wanted to share. And there is um, a little discount if you mention you learned about it here on this webinar. So thanks. <laughs> and now to you, Steve. Great. Well, I'm very happy to announce our speakers for today. Uh, and, and the order of the presentation, it seems. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Maria Broderick is a developmental psychologist and acupuncturist with a specialty in pediatrics. She is an associate professor and director of clinical education at the New England School of Acupuncture at MCPHS University. Since 2010, she has served as the pediatric acupuncturist at the Boston Medical Center, where she oversees acupuncture training in the pediatric pain clinic. Dr. Broderick holds a doctorate in human development and psychology from Harvard University and a master's in acupuncture and oriental medicine from the New England School of Acupuncture. Next person. Here we have Dr. Laura Goldstein. She is a pediatric psychologist with a focus on pediatric chronic pain. She specializes in mind-body strategies for the management of pain. Dr. Goldstein uses cognitive behavioral interventions and has training in hypnosis and biofeedback. She received her doctorate from the George Washington University and completed her postdoctoral fellowship at John Hopkins University. Next speaker. Here we have Christine Naum Heffernan. She's been practicing as a pediatric nurse for the last 30 years and has training or specialty training in integrative therapies, including but are not limited to 200 hour yoga teacher training, clinical hypnosis, biofeedback, clinical aromatherapy, Reiki, as well as sound energy, trauma-informed care, and specializes in pediatric pain. She has worked at Boston Medical Center for 16 years and currently works in the pediatric pain clinic 
as well as the pulmonary, allergy, and neurology clinics. She is a former chair of the Integrative Nurses Council, whose goal is it is to educate staff and transform the acute care model to include integrative medicine as part of a pain management accessible to all adults and children. She also collaborates to put together an annual integrative nurse nursing conference annually as part of Nurses Week. And the next is, uh, and this will be our next speaker, will be Dr. Caitlin Neary. She is a pediatric hematologist, oncologist at Boston Medical Center, where she specializes in not only pediatric hematology and oncology, but also sickle cell diseases, uh, disease and chronic pain. She received her medical degree from Ross University School of Medicine and has been practicing for over 20 years. She has completed her fellowship in hematology oncology at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC, and is an instructor of pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine here in Massachusetts. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Neary to begin the presentation. Thank you very much. I just want to thank the AIHN for this opportunity to share our work with you and most importantly, our team with you. I am so blessed to work with this fabulous team. It's so critical to everything that we do. So um, thank you for letting us do this in a team uh, presentation. <clears throat> okay, jumping right in, if you could advance for me. Um, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the origins of our pediatric pain clinic, um, quite a bit about the integrative teamwork environment that we have created, um, and how we use integrative strategies um, to influence patient outcomes. Good advance, thank you, um, and advance. So, so Boston Medical Center is our home. Um, we have... Uh, our clinic here, and uh, BMC, as, as it's known, is an urban safety net hospital here in Boston, where the vast majority of our patients come from underserved populations. Um, uh, our, our clients are dealing with all sorts of challenges. Um, we have many new immigrant families, many families where English is not their first language, and social determinants of health are integrated into the work we do every day. Um, we are also a level one trauma center and the teaching hospital for Boston University School of Medicine. Um, it's a 482 bed hospital with the full spectrum of pediatric primary and specialty care. Um, there are about 50,000 pediatric visits a year. Um, and a really special part of the Department of Pediatrics is our uh, 200 children and adolescents with, um, who are living with sickle cell disease. So we had this opportunity to um, offer integrative care for um, an underserved pediatric uh, pain cohort. Um, the, um, you know, when I came to BMC at, about eight years ago, I had an interest in, in um, putting together a pediatric pain program. And after some initial work um, had discovered this wealth of integrative expertise, um, that existed at Boston Medical Center, mainly within the Department of Family Medicine that had been only sort of minimally tapped into for pediatrics, but there was so much expertise, which is really very unique to have somebody like Maria, who was already um, working at BMC at the time that I started. And, um, and so we had this opportunity to think about using integrative medicine in pediatrics um, and sort of set out on this project to develop a um, pediatric pain clinic. So um, this is our, our referral process. Um, kids are referred to our clinic either by their PCP or by their specialist. It's actually very common for kids to come to us um, after um, being seen by many doctors, you know, sometimes a neurologist and a um, uh, or a multiple gastroenterologists. Um, and so that, that's relatively common um, that this has been going on a long time and they've seen a lot of providers by the time they come to us. So our initial evaluation is really focused on um, establishing the team approach and 
sort of hearing the story from the patient um, uh, all at the same time. So we all sit together in one room, myself, Dr. Goldstein, Christine, our um, uh, physical therapist, whose name is Elise, um, and our social worker. And we, um, we hear what's gone on with the patient's pain over sometimes many years, um, and then uh, complete the clinical evaluations on that first visit. And then subsequent to that, the patient returns, usually within a couple of weeks, to get started on their individualized pain management plan. And it's on those follow-up days that we build in all of our integrative services. So this slide just um, describes our referral services. Um, the sources rather. So we see um, kids that come to us from neurology clinic, absolutely, um, with uh, chronic daily headaches or migraines. Um, kids come to us from GI clinic with functional abdominal pain or daily stomach aches. Um, we've seen several kids from genetics with different conditions, some children with Ehlers-Danlos, others with um, painful skin conditions, all sorts of things. Um, and then we have these 200 kids with sickle cell disease who almost all can benefit from seeing us in the pain clinic. Um, we get many referrals from primary care and adolescent medicine, as well as the community health centers. And honestly, far and wide, you know, people come from all over New England um, and even farther sometimes um, to see us in the clinic. And um, what's very important is the interdisciplinary team. Um, and I say interdisciplinary as opposed to multidisciplinary because uh, interdisciplinary really implies that there are um, different um, expertise, different training, different backgrounds, but sort of the same overall goal. Um, and the close communication between the team members is really critical. It's much different than me seeing a patient in my office and saying, oh, you ought to go try acupuncture or you should get physical therapy. It's much different than um, when we sort of uh, work together in the same space and the, the patient sort of feels that, that team approach and, and understands that the team approach is, is critical to their recovery. So our pain management plans incorporate integrative therapies really right there in the same clinical space. So the physical therapy evaluation takes place in our clinic on day one. Um, sometimes we do refer for skilled PT in the community because if you're going for skilled PT, sometimes it's like twice a week and it, it can be easier to get that close to home. But we sort of keep in touch with the community providers um, throughout the physical therapy. Um, and then all of the mind-body strategies are delivered right within the clinic. Um, you know, after I do my, my medical clinical evaluation and update, Dr. Goldstein comes right in and um, jumps in with her um, non-farm strategies. Um, and Maria and her acupuncture students are delivering acupuncture right there in the clinic. Um, our massage therapist as well right there in the clinic. Um, and then Christine does so many things. She'll be delivering Reiki or aromatherapy or doing some yoga or some breath work, um, whatever she sort of um, decides is the right thing um, a lot, you know, in combination with the, with the child and family. And we always say it's not a cookie cutter approach. You don't get the same thing every time. Um, our job is to just help people explore um, things that they, that they might find beneficial and um, really sort of like take the control back for their pain. Um, and, and that's all done in a really interdisciplinary way. So our treatment plans um, are um, comprehensive. You can see I put medications as number six because while I do use many medications to treat persistent pain, um, to treat um, you know different evidence-based approaches for functional abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, or evidence-based approaches for migraine and chronic daily headache, um, or neuropathic pain. It's not the big deal of our um, treatment plans. The non-farm is um, really uh, critically important. Not every patient even gets any medication management, but every patient gets the non-farm approaches. 
Um, so often physical therapy is prescribed. Some sort of exercise is always prescribed. Um, we encourage our kids and teens to use yoga and martial arts and other things like that as part of their um, um, treatment plan, spending time outdoors and in nature. Um, and then we use a range of integrative strategies. We use acupuncture, acupressure, aromatherapy, massage, Reiki. Um, we also use um, a variety of behavioral strategies, which Dr. Goldstein will spend a lot of time talking about. And then um, we do a lot of lifestyle interventions, um, which we all work sort of together on. Our social worker certainly helps a lot, but we try to normalize the social environment, um, attending school, meeting up with friends, participating in age appropriate activities, normalizing sleep and um, a good healthy diet to aid in, in pain recovery. And then we do a lot of family coaching, um, which a lot of that is done by Dr. Goldstein and also our social worker, but also Christine and, and myself um, and Maria doing some sort of, um, you, you know, encouraging families on how to support their kids in this pain recovery um, by sort of not focusing on pain, but focusing on, on the positive strategies that help to um, recover from pain. So just a little bit about some definitions. Um, since we're talking about pain, we know that pain is an experience. It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience, but there doesn't have to be actual tissue damage if we're talking about pain versus nociception, which is sort of the neural process of um, the impulse that comes to the brain after a noxious stimuli. Um, you may like it may raise your heart rate or your blood pressure, but this, the sensation of pain is not necessarily implied. So um, uh, if you can just go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so we don't mind pain as long as it doesn't hurt. So that we do a lot of education with our kids and our families to teach them that 100% of the pain that you experience is produced by the brain. And so we can sort of use that strong connection to use the mind to sort of dial down the pain experience that we feel. Um, and there can be some medications that can help with that process, but a lot of it is um, these mind-body strategies and non-farm approaches. So the types of pain, if you could just advance for me, there's acute pain, which is when there um, is, that's like big pain. Um, there is a tissue injury, the candle is burning, um, uh, such as from inflammation and injury and infection. Um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about acute pain. And next is subacute pain. So that can be an ongoing cause. So like a smoldering pain, not this big acute pain, but there is some ongoing nerve in uh, tissue injury and the candle is still burning in some way, like a chronic infection or um, an arthritis. Then there's chronic pain that's not associated with tissue injury. So this is the vast majority of what we're taking care of in our chronic pain clinic. And this is when the pain persists after everything is healed up as best as it's going to be. Next, please. And then there's these um, acute on chronic pain. So that can be recurrent episodes of tissue injury, such as somebody with recurrent sickle cell crises or um, somebody with inflammatory bowel disease and recurrent flares, um, where there are these um, recurrent episodes of acute pain that starts to take on a more chronic appearance. So these, if you could advance, these two here on the right are really what we're taking care of in our chronic pain clinic. Um, it's generally a very long-term problem and we always, um, tell our families that a long-term problem requires a long-term solution. So we're not going to wave our magic wands, but something that's been going on a very long time takes some time to correct. But if they stick with us, we usually have pretty good luck. Go ahead. So chronic pain in, is extraordinarily common in children. Um, conservative estimates have suggested that up to 35% of American school children are impacted by chronic pain. And the vast majority can be attributed to one of the following, 
um, chronic daily headaches and migraines, chronic abdominal pain, and musculoskeletal pain. And that's really the vast majority of what we're taking care of in our program. So definitions can be challenging when talking about chronic pain in kids. Um, you know, it can be described as just lasting beyond the usual um, uh, course of healing. Um, sometimes you'll see time definitions of, you know, up to more than three months or more than six months. Um, you can also just say pain that continues when it ought not to. Um, and you can also classify it by its pathophysiology, meaning the functional changes um, resulting from the disease, which can be nociceptive, like ongoing tissue injury, or can be resulting from uh, neuropathic mechanisms where there are functional changes in the nervous system, um, which lead to the continued um, experience of pain, um, or it can be a mixture of both. So there really is a biopsychosocial framework to understand the pathophysiology of chronic pain. There are often biological changes, um, sometimes an injury or an illness that can be the trigger. Um, there are sometimes genetic predispositions. We see chronic pain run in families um, for reasons that are incompletely understood. And then there are um, a lot of social factors that are at play where the the child or teenager withdraws from family, school, things they used to enjoy. Um, their parents play a crucial role. The parent, the parental response to pain, their own emotions, cognitions, and behavior, and also um, peers obviously play a role. There are psychological um, factors involved in the pathophysiology of chronic pain, our emotions, thoughts, behaviors, and any psych logical comorbidities can also be involved. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Goldstein to, to speak more about the um, psychological and social risk factors and um, strategies. Thanks, Dr. Mary. Thanks for having me today. Um, so I just want to kind of tag on to what uh, Dr. Mary was saying um, related to all the factors that can contribute to pain. Um, you know, we know that all, you know, there's so many family factors and social factors. Um, we've seen um, kids miss uh, numerous days of school or even months of school uh, due to, uh, you know, uh, fears about attending school with the pain or um, bullying or um, just social isolation. Um, and then the psychological, which I'm going to talk a lot more about. Um, you know, how kids cope with, with not just with pain, but with general stressors, um, you know, that's, that can be a big factor in managing pain because pain is a significant stressor. Um, and just uh, their history of anxiety and, and uh, mood issues, um, stress in general. Um, and then um, this family history of pain, it, it can be a, a really uh, big one we see, um, you know, numerous families come in um, who have a long history of, of chronic pain. And, and, you know, that can be a lot of uh, modeling that, you know, this child is growing up with um, is seeing their uh, parent or guardian um, in pain and how they're dealing with it. Um, and then we have a lot of health habits that we address. Um, sleep is one of the, the biggest ones that we tend to address first. Um, a lot of our studies have shown that, you know, uh, you know, majority of our kids have really significant sleep dysfunction. Um, so, you know, really focusing on that to get them back on track and then a variety of other factors, including diet and physical activity. Um, so you can advance. So with, in terms of the psychological factors, um, there's been a lot of studies that have shown that, you know, kids with um, with chronic pain have, um, you know, significant symptoms of or, you know, it has been associated with significant symptoms of depression. And that can go either way. Um, you know, that can be a, be a history of depression or, um, you know, and then they're uh, more susceptible to this chronic pain presentation um, or they, you know, have this chronic pain and, and that can lead to more depression. Um, and, you know, there's been numerous things that are related to depression, including uh, sleep issues. 
um, academic problems and social problems. Um, again, we see this maladaptive coping and then um, a number of our kids come in with very high anxiety, um, either related to the pain or otherwise, um, but it, it typically contributes to worsening pain. Um, kids may end up avoiding feared uh, places due to having had uh, pain experiences there or not, um, but you know they are afraid of, uh, of having pain in those situations um, or the pain increasing. And so they end up avoiding social interactions, they end up avoiding school, and um, one kind of feeds the other. So it does become this really entrenched cycle. You can advance. Um, as we mentioned before, it does tend to run in families. Um, you know, kids are, are experiencing uh, psychosocial issues, academic problems, um, and uh, a lot of changes in, in their mood and behavior um, with this chronic pain presentation. Um, you see a lot of high levels of, of parenting stress. Um, you know, it's a very stressful um, interaction to have to deal, you know, and manage, a, a, you know, a child who has chronic pain. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a daily thing. Um, and, you know, a lot of these parents are trying to get their kids to go to school and to uh, do all these things. And, and, it, and it can be a real struggle. Um, and, you know, a lot of these kids end up falling into this, this sick role um, where they're the kid with pain. Um, and, you know, parents just have a hard time knowing how to respond to that. Um, and can, you know, inadvertently end up feeding it as well. Um, it also creates, you know, a financial burden on, on the families, um, you know, missed work um, and having to bring their kids to multiple appointments. Advance. Um, so, you know, as we're talking about, you know, the psychological piece and how to kind of manage this pain, um, a lot of what I do is non, you know, non-farm strategies. Um, so, you know, relaxation-based strategies and um, part of it is, you know, educating families, educating kids and families to, uh, for them to understand why we're doing this, um, that there's actually a scientific reason why this is important, um, and that, you know, these messages are being sent to the brain, and stress actually increases uh, the pain presentation. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the is kind of just setting up that foundation and then giving them the strategies to practice. Um, so I do a lot of di diaphragmatic uh, breathing uh, or deep breathing, um, meditation, um, progressive muscle relaxation, which is basically progressively uh, tensing and, and relaxing different parts of your body. Um, you know, a lot of imagery. Um, and then the, I am trained in biofeedback, which is using um, information from your body uh, to basically be able to show um, how stress uh, affects affects the body, um, and so that they can use these strategies more effectively at home and, and see, oh yeah, when I do this, it does increase my stress, or when I do this, it does decrease my stress. Um, I'm trained in, uh, in hypnosis, which is a kind of a deep relaxation um, exercise, um, and I'll use a lot of visualization um, to get kids to uh, be able to um, kind of tone down their what we call the volume of their pain. Um, and also kind of teaching uh, kids and families how to use distraction um, so they, they're not constantly focused on the pain. Um, another piece of what I do is, um, as I use a lot of uh, cognitive behavioral interventions. Um, so getting kids, to, kids and teens and families uh, to understand how their thoughts uh, contribute to their feelings, which also contribute to their behaviors. Um, and so with pain, what often happens is you have some sort of sensation in your body, um, you know, and it's interpreted as something awful and terrible uh, because that's how we see pain. Um, and so there must be something wrong. And so they end up, you know, developing a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, hypervigilance about their body, um, you know, interpreting every little sensation as something that could be wrong. Um, and, you know, with those, those thoughts come a lot of, uh, you know, feeling uh, down, feeling anxious. Um, and so, and these feelings again, contribute to this cycle. So 
It can be a feeling contributes to um, avoidance behavior or, uh, you know, it, it increases certain thoughts. Um, but again, it's that cycle and getting uh, kids and families to understand how this cycle um, is contributing to their uh, chronic pain presentation. Um, so with that, uh, I do some cognitive skills training. So getting um, kids to kind of link their thoughts to their feelings and understanding that sometimes um, these automatic thoughts pop into their head, um, you know, when they feel these sensations and, um, you know, what they can do at those moments um, in order to kind of uh, challenge those thoughts or reframe those thoughts. Um, doing a lot of uh, more positive self-talk. Um, this is a really good uh, workbook for kids and teens that actually, um, that I use some exercises from. Um, and then another piece is the behaviors. So because they often end up avoiding certain things and that feeds the pain, um, part of what we do in our clinic is really trying to get them back to those activities. Um, and so that could be increasing physical activity, that could be slowly getting them back to school, um, just being able to get them out of the house and doing things that they enjoy. Um, and, you know, uh, we do a very slow approach to going back to school. I work very closely with the schools, myself and the social worker, um, and um, getting kids to kind of attend uh, part of the time, a couple hours, a half day, a full day. So doing it in a very slow fashion. Um, and then doing a lot of positivity, focusing on, um, you know, their functioning, focusing on what they did well, um, and giving um, a lot of reinforcement for that. Um, and then a big part is, is the parent intervention strategies. Um, it is getting parents to understand that this is, chronic pain presentation is very different from having a kid with an acute pain presentation. Um, you know, when your kid is ill, you're used to just, you know, uh, support, you know, giving them a lot of attention, having them sleep in, giving them lots of different things to make them feel comfortable. And that's exactly the opposite of what we want um, these parents to do. Um, while we want them, of course, to be supportive of, of their kids, we would also want them to um, not focus on the pain and we want them to encourage uh, functioning. Um, so with that, you know, we always, you know, make sure parents uh, reinforce to their kids that this pain is real, um, that we believe them, that it's, you know, it's, it's something that they're really experiencing, but that doesn't mean that we, um, you know, that we're not doing things and we're not trying to get up and, and moving. Um, and so we tell parents, you know, really try not to ask kids about their pain. Um, we talk about pain in the clinic, but outside of the clinic is really about what can they do to help their pain? Uh, what can they do to make it better? Um, and so we're giving, uh, you know, parents, you know, kind of empowering them to help their kids in that way. Um, we also encourage them to use, um, you know, positive pain coping themselves uh, because a lot of these parents are dealing with their own pain issues. Um, and encouraging good sleep, and then just focusing on that this uh, problem is going to take a while, like Dr. Neer is saying, it, it does require a long-term solution. Um, and this right here is a really good book that we um, hand out to a lot of our families, uh, When Your Child Hurts by Dr. Coakley at Boston Children's, one of our colleagues. And now I will uh, turn it over to uh, Maria. Thank you, Laura. So uh, BMC welcomed acupuncture actually back in the early 2000s into pediatrics. Um, we started a decade prior, as Dr. Neary referenced, um, offering acupuncture prior to the launch of the pediatric pain clinic. And it's a really interesting story, actually, how pediatric acupuncture got started here at BMC. Uh, the door was first opened, actually, um, via a program called Healing Landscapes, which was uh, a Ford Foundation-funded initiative that was housed in medical anthropology at the BU School of Medicine, and it aimed to make forms of traditional medicine accessible to BMC patients who desired it. 
And so uh, pediatric acupuncture um, was launched under that umbrella of the Healing Landscapes Project. And that was the point in time at which the New England School of Acupuncture began partnering with BMC to deliver acupuncture services. Um, at that time, uh, NISA did have other relationships um, with other uh, hospitals and community health centers, but this was the first initiative uh, that NISA launched in partnership that was focused on a pediatric ambulatory clinic. And um, it gave our students uh, their first access to working side by side with hospital personnel. Um, it was first launched actually in the adolescent outpatient clinic and then later expanded um, in 2004, we were in adolescent medicine and then late 2005, uh, we actually were able to work inpatient, um, seeing kids with pain conditions um, under the general direction of the, the pediatrics program. Um, next slide, please. And one of the services that we've been pleased to provide over the years inpatient is actually um, through a partnership with neonatology. We've worked for many years to deliver a form of pediatric uh, medical massage, as well as um, what are known as uh, in acupuncture speak, non-insertive techniques. So using tools that are non-insertive to um, work with uh, neonates um, uh, suffering from neonatal abstinence syndrome. So that's one of our enduring initiatives. And um, in the last several years, we've worked with uh, Dr. Alicia Walkman on that program, which was paused for COVID, but we hope to restart. Um, and then uh, next slide, please. As Dr. Neri mentioned, um, when she was first exploring launching pediatric services uh, as part of the pain clinic, um, she carried out a needs assessment. And as she referenced, the presence of a sustainable pediatric acupuncture program uh, was viewed as favorable to being offer, you know, being able to offer a range of integrative services. Uh, our pediatric acupuncture program had already demonstrated um, its capacity to attract families, um, its, its record of safety, and our ability to uh, put children at ease and introduce acupuncture to them as a service. So we had that foundation laid before the pediatric pain clinic um, was launched. Um, and the, uh, as she mentioned, those services are delivered by um, New England School of Acupuncture interns under the supervision of a preceptor. And I have been that preceptor since 2010. Um, the uh, interns, when we joined the pediatric pain clinic um, were then moved. Now our, the PD pain clinic is our primary home here at BMC. And as Dr. Neary mentioned, we're here together in service. In fact, um, today is one of our integrative care delivery days. Um, so the team you know, does their initial intake on Monday and then Wednesday is the day where we're here together to uh, deliver integrative services and also do follow-up care with the patients. Um, NISA is the oldest acupuncture school in the country and we place um, our advanced students here uh, for semester long rotations. Uh, since 2004, we've placed over 300 acupuncture students in pediatric rotations at BMC. So I think it's the longest uh, standing pediatric rotation in the country and certainly the longest in a safety net hospital. Um, we've delivered in that time frame in our three um, contexts of care, inpatient, outpatient, adolescent, and PD pain now over 6,000 treatments. And we have um, numerous graduates who, uh, you know, really use this rotation as a stepping stone to see children and families in their own private practices. And as well, we have um, several NISA grads who now have um, staff positions here at BMC. Uh, one of our grads from the pediatric pain clinic uh, is now the staff acupuncturist in family medicine. And we've expanded our services um, beyond family medicine as well to include internal medicine. So costs to um, BMC for our services are minimal. Um, really, they consist of using the existing space um, available to the pain clinic as well as um, you know, scheduling support, but the um, acupuncture college 
provides all of the acupuncture supplies, underwrites the salary for the preceptor. Um, and so part of the nature of the sustainability of our program relates to this partnership with the New England School of Acupuncture. Um, I'm just uh, so pleased um, with the reception acupuncture has received across BMC um, and especially in this environment of the pain clinic where our students have been really made to feel part of the clinic, important, playing an important role in the care of these children. Um, in addition to acupuncture, um, we have a flexible set of tools in Chinese medicine. So they also provide acupressure, cupping, gua sha, and uh, tui now, which is kind of gentle um, pediatric medical massage. So we work really flexibly uh, with the families addressing what the child or teen is comfortable with. No one has to have acupuncture in the service, um, but for the most part, um, over many years, we found it to be very well accepted um, and welcomed by families uh, who've really come to appreciate the wonderful services that our interns uh, provide to them. Um, in 2015, just as a note, NISA merged with the Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, which is a health sciences university. And through that relationship, um, MCPHS University has continued to uh, support um, our placements at BMC here and provide our students with a platform of interprofessional educational experiences of which the BMC pediatric rotation is an important contributor. Uh, so uh, we look forward to um, an enduring partnership. And I will turn it over to Christine. Hello. Uh, so little typo, I'm not a doctor. I do have my, my master's, um, but you know, you never know, maybe I'll go back again. Um, but the pediatric pain clinic is, is my passion. Uh, and I'm really proud to be part of this team. And so I bring the nursing component to this. So I think the first thing that I wanted to comment on is the language. Um, over time, we've used things like uh, alternative or complementary or holistic, which each has their own connotation. Um, holism, yeah, we look at the whole thing. Alternative implies one versus the other. Um, but integrative really implies taking pieces of the puzzle and putting it all together. So it is really important that sometimes medicine is needed, but we also know that if we can help our kids by providing not only uh, a medical, but psychosocial and hit all their needs all the way across the board that we get these kids in a much better place. Um, so the nursing component that I bring, I do have multiple roles. Um, one is simple stuff, like I run the clinic and make sure it flows and make sure everyone has their appointments and try to uh, make it so the clinic goes smoothly so that we don't have a lot of downtime. Our kids are with us on average for about three hours on the Wednesday afternoons. So uh, that can be a lot for them. So if we can keep things moving, that works pretty well. Um, my training, I've got a lot of things, but the things that I bring specifically to the clinic is Reiki. If people are or are not familiar with it, it is a light touch energy therapy that can be done hands on or hands off. Um, and basically what it does is we work as a conduit, the energy runs through us and it allows the body to be put into a nice state of homeostasis where the body can naturally heal itself. So I'm not special in magic, no Reiki practitioner is magic. Um, but what we do do is put the body in an optimal state of healing. And I think the best way to explain this is if you ever have a cut and you are super stressed out, that cup can take forever to heal. And yet other times, if you're in a good state of mind, you can have a cut and it healed overnight. And we don't question that. So we know that stress hinders the body and any way that we can help get it in a better place is gonna help. So, um, and in, a, in an ideal setting, a Reiki session is an hour, but realistically either in clinic or if I get called to do an inpatient, um, either 10, 15 minutes or if all you have is five, it's better than nothing and it really does make a difference. Um, aromatherapy, I am skills validated and what that means is I work under an aromatherapist who's done the formal certification training, um, but we work with, and we've created policies for, 
And so we have about six oils that I will sit down and have the client smell them. I don't tell them what they are or what they're for. And I let the kids smell it and then I make a blend specific for them. And the oils that we use, um, we use peppermint, bergamot, black pepper, frankincense, mandarin and lavender and usually some combination of those will hit all the things that my team has already alluded to it helps with headaches it helps with belly aches it helps with stress and anxiety so i don't tell the kids what it's for i let them smell it and then their body viscerally decides what they need and then i go back and say hey your body actually chose the one that you actually needed so then they think that's really cool because how could they have known um so it just creates more buy-in uh yoga uh, I think most of the panel here has done some form of yoga. Again, when we do yoga, it's not about doing a full yoga set. It's just about checking in to see where the kid is at, what is going to help them most. Like if they have belly aches, then we might be focusing on forward folds. If they've got a lot of stress and anxiety, I might do balance poses because that has to uh, create some humor when you keep falling down. Um, or if they have a lot of tension in their shoulders and neck, then I'll come up with exercises specific to that. Um, I'm also trained in mind-body strategies that supports a lot of the work uh, that Dr. Goldstein does. Um, so I have um, biofeedback. And again, as it was explained, biofeedback uses instruments and projects the energy on a computer screen. And so then the kid can engage in a game and that allows them to see, oh, when I'm all like, I'm all anxious, my car is wiping out, but if I can calm down, then I can get control of my car versus hypnosis, which is very internal. And some of our kids do better with that. Um, those kids, um, we use the mind to help create a safe place. And then we explore the discomfort breathe into it, try to change the colors and the intensity of it, and then create a frame in their mind, a file in their computer so that they can come back to this later on um, and, and utilize it later. And then, which leads me to education. So I, I, I live and breathe pediatrics, so I call it a, a toy box, right? So toy box, toolbox, whatever you want to call it. But the idea is that we have a bunch of different things in there so that when the kid is feeling a certain way, that they can pull that out. They might want to do aromatherapy one day. They might rather do yoga another day. They might have that um, ability to start exploring um, some of the other skills that are taught with Dr. Goldstein. We have apps for them to use on their phone. The idea is that we keep reminding them to go back because it's all well and good that they learn a tool and that's great. But if you don't remember to go back to that tool, you haven't built that muscle. And then the other thing I wanna to say too is a lot of times we might see a kid who's really in pain. And so I try to teach them something and they may not really buy in all that much because <laughs> they're so uncomfortable. But if, if we can teach them how to do it, and then I say, go home and practice, 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 practice. The more they practice on the days that they feel good and they realize, hey, I actually feel kind of good, then they can access that when they're miserable, okay? So it's about education, it's about reinforcement, um, and it's about giving them or empowering them that they are 100% in charge of their body. And so I'm not gonna make them do anything, but I do want them to try it, check it out for themselves. And if they like it, great. If they don't, I'm gonna find something else. Um, and um, I think that's good for this slide. Can you advance? Thank you. Uh, so these are just some of our books. Uh, and depending upon how old your kids are, the Breathe With Me and the Good Night Yoga um, are really good for your younger population. And then it depends on the kid, but I'd say like probably eight and younger. Uh, they love, 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 love these books. They're so good. Um, and you can do a quick review with them, show them how to use it. And then the kids will practice it at night. So we give them these books to take them um, for home. Um, we have uh, a whole handout for apps, which I'm actually going to go back to my team. Are we providing resources? Because I was thinking of a couple of videos that we might be able to provide. And then the apps that we have, I think would be willing to share those as well. So just let me know if you guys want that information. Um, and then we give them uh, handouts 
uh, to reinforce the education that we've taught them. And yes, I have done lots of stick figures from my yoga poses. Next slide, please. Okay, and then I think uh, Maria is up yeah, next. Can, oh no, Caitlin, can, excuse me. Thank you, Christine, so much. I'll just jump in so we can thank finish you. up and have time for questions. Um, we just wanted to mention that um, one of the initiatives in our Department of Pediatrics is a, uh, it's called the Center for the Urban Child and Healthy Family, which is sort of our future direction um, of our department where there's a lot of uh, research projects and, and clinical initiatives. And some of the landscape work had, um, had um, uncovered this desire uh, amongst the participants in the focus groups to have a more integrative and um, uh, holistic approach to, um, to uh, pediatric uh, health and wellness. And so um, we really, we hope that we're gonna be able to serve as a model for ways that this kind of care can be delivered um, across um, many different healthcare settings. Going on. Yes, going on. Um, so I am definitely much more of a clinician educator than a researcher, but I just wanted to share one of that we've done different research projects over the years, but one was um, when we were initially rolling out our um, expanding our integrative therapies beyond acupuncture when we first opened, um, we did a feasibility project um, looking at um, uh, our, our sort of initial cohort. Um, you can just see here are some of our demographics going on. And um, we, there was a number of different um, uh, clinical indicators that we tracked in this group of um, 80 or so uh, children going on. Um, you can skip this one so we get done. Um, but one thing that we looked at was trying to um, have a cost effectiveness component to this work. And so um, through chart review and also family interviews, we documented um, all of the different medical interventions that had been, been done. Um, and uh, really in this project didn't even include opportunity costs in terms of parents' time and lost wages and such, but really just um, looked at the medical interventions and tried uh, to quantify um, how much that would cost in the year before the uh, child worked with us and in the year after. Going ahead. So this is our um, sort of our results of um, the uh, these children who who worked with us and some of the pain types that they had. Go ahead. And um, we were able to estimate the the cost of um, and you can see over on the right hand column the total cost for these eighty three kids at baseline for the year prior, there's quite a lot of money spent on um, surgical procedures like endoscopies and things like that, on medications, on hospitalizations, and on consultations with many specialists. Going ahead. And um, then we were able to look at the year following for um, at least 46 kids who we had that full year of data on and saw a really dramatic reduction in um, in healthcare costs um, in this sort of um, in the this sort of limited method that we that we looked at which was a sort of a self-report not a dollars and cents kind of a, a insurance claims um, data but these data were based on self-report and chart review going on so our future directions for this clinic is really, you know, like many people in healthcare, we are currently in the process of rebuilding after the uh, effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, which are still impacting us as I'm currently in quarantine at home with my family. Um, but we are um, trying to sustain this model within our hospital system. I think we've become pretty pretty permanent. Um, we're no longer a pilot. Um, we're sort of well integrated into the department and I'm not worried that we're going anywhere 
uh, anymore, <laughs> although I spent many years worrying about that. Um, I hope that we can serve as a model for interdisciplinary care um, within pediatrics and beyond, and we hope to grow to meet the deme demands of our community. Okay, with that, I'll take some questions. I, I think, um, yeah, so that paper uh, is still in press, but um, it was presented at APHA um, by our one of our colleagues who's a cost effectiveness expert and was on our team. Um, okay, so um, what else? The resources, yeah, I'm happy to share any resources, that's fine. Um, models, need more models that can be used in private practice and non-hospital base. Yeah, all I can say is we've been very creative. We have uh, not asked a lot of permission and we've just forged ahead doing things that we think make sense um, and it's worked. So um, I think the best thing to do is just to try things. You know, we sort of just set up shop saying, I'm gonna see patients and Dr. Goldstein's gonna be here with me. There's always logistics uh, like, you know, she bills into psychiatry and I build in, bill into pediatrics. So we have to have the templates done and how does the billing work and who arrives the patients. And there's a lot of like logistics, but once you get that set up, it, it um, tends to work. Um, has there been discussion about expanding the integrative team to include chiropractic care? That's a good question. Um, in pediatrics, the, um, you know, so we have sent some older kid, uh, I would say adults, young adults to chiropractic care in the community. We don't have a chiropractor at um, BMC. And, um, you know, in my most recent review of the data, there's, there's still, um, not enough good data for me to be recommending uh, chiropractic care for children, um, although it's something I continue to look at. But um, in general, um, for, for adults or older teens, we have sent people to the community. Um, let me see. Yeah, here's some of our links and things in the chat, which you're welcome to check us out. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions for my other team members, or I'm happy to answer anything else. We're so close to the wrap up time. I'm, I'm wondering if we can uh, pause and thank the team so much. If there are questions that aren't answered, please put them in the chat and we will follow up with the team and the integrative practice webinar project team. This has been incredible, inspiring to know that these, the, these things are going on. So Jess, do you want to, to, to show our last slides? And, um... Sure, I know I saw there's a few more questions rolling in right now too. And um, I know we, we would love to get to them all, but we probably don't have time. So um, yeah, I want to say definitely a big thank you to everyone as well. And um, I, I'm also sharing, we've got our, our conference coming up this October, which is completely virtual now. We want to remind everyone that that's, you know, here and available, and I'll put um, some links in the in the chat as well, so that you can um, access uh, the website to learn more about the conference and to register. Um, and then there are uh, we've got some upcoming events. Our next webinar, which will be after the conference on November fifth, in a SCU sponsored um, uh, genetics series. We've got astounding successes using gene therapies. It'll be the third part in the series, and there's a registration link in the chat for that. And the next um, AIHM and ACIH integrative practice webinar of this series will be on November 12th, uh, addressing chronic pain and integrating physical function services into community health centers. The registration link for that is also in the chat. And again, the fellowship is, there's the next cohort starting this October. The following cohort will begin in April of 2022. So if that's something you've been thinking about, definitely reach out to us. Link also in the chat for everyone. And as always, please, you know, stay connected with us, the Academy on our um, different 
uh, social media accounts and um, you can join our chapters or Students Alliance and become a member. I don't know if there's anything you want to add there, Beth. I would like, uh, Steve, if you're available to come on and, and thank, thank the speakers and team again, this has just been absolutely incredible. Yes, I've been hearing about their work for so many years through my colleague, um, Dr. Broderick, and I was really excited to be able to uh, know that they had a chance to speak with us today. So thank you so much for your time and all the amazing work that you're doing with kids here in the Boston area. I'm a Boston area boy myself, so thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, thank you for all the work you do and for sharing information in the chat too. We really appreciate that. So everyone have a great week. Bye. <laughs>